On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Allison, and Allison was married to a controlling financial abuser. It's a story of isolation, dependency, sowing the seeds of doubt, the in-law cult, and the healing process. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Allison. How are you? I am doing well today. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. And if you want to be a guest like Allison is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please do read all of the instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do read all of the instructions and send it in in the format that we ask for. And today we are going to hear Allison's story and for the most part, unusually, I don't know much about your story. Most of the time I have a general idea of what I'm about to hear. But today, everyone, we're pretty much going to be winging it. So besides a few details, I know this is a really fresh story for me to hear as well. Uh, so the things I do know is that you dealt with a lot of financial abuse and that your abuser was very much a water torturer and a Mr. Right combo from the Lundy Bancroft list of abusers. Someone who was going to very much establish themselves as an authority and to do it in a way without raising their voice. So it was a very subtle in a lot of ways. So Allison, I really just want to thank you for being here today. And I'm just going to get out of my way and your way. Allison, the floor is now yours. Okay. Well, thanks so much for having me. And I really appreciate being able to be here and share my story and hopefully give some hope and inspiration um, to other people out there who may have experienced something similar. So my story is that I'm a survivor of 20 years of what I believe to be covert narcissistic abuse. I started out from when I was a child. Um, I grew up in what you would normally think was a really, really ideal childhood. Um, I had two married parents until I was about 13 when they got divorced. Um, The divorce didn't really affect me. Um, I had an older brother. And for for most of my life, I felt very loved. I felt very encouraged. I was the child who got good grades, who did well in school, who was well-liked, had a lot of friends, teachers, parents, everyone, you know, I was sort of like the golden child. I was also the person who never wanted to create any conflict, who always wanted everyone to get along, who didn't like there to be fighting or drama or anything like that. As a, as a very young child, I was like like this. And um, I know now looking back at my childhood, because a lot of times, you know, 2020 hindsight, um, I can, place together some things that um, that I experienced as a child that led me into the arms of what I believe is a, an abuser. So basically what those things were, um, things like always feeling like I had to achieve or do something in order to be seen, in order to be heard, right? So though I had great parents and though they were Um, loving. My mom worked a lot of nights. She had a job where she wasn't around. I was after home after school. And on the weekends, she also worked and my dad was present a lot. Um, And I have a have a great relationship with both of my parents. But um, I think that part of my issue was that I was always looking to be seen and always looking to be heard. So, So everything I did as a child was to get the best grades to get the awards in school to be in the art shows and get the blue ribbons and it was always about doing more to be seen. And so now I'm able to see that. But back then, obviously, I was too young to know. And even throughout my adulthood, when I was with the abuser, I wasn't aware that that was happening um, or what really kind of propelled me into a relationship that I was in. When it comes to you being 19 years old or, you know, your, your childhood, uh, 
are you religious? Do you have religious kind of beliefs about marriage? Um, you know, do you have like a man does this, a woman does this kind of attitude? How do you view the world? And for yourself, uh, how did you view relationships? And what did you specifically want in your life? Okay, so that's a really good question, and I and I will I will answer it with this um, caveat because the way I saw the world at nineteen is very different from how I see it today. But back in nineteen, um, it was you know yes, you find the love of your life, you get married, you stay together forever. Like I had these beliefs about marriage that marriage is a one time thing. Even though I had grown up seeing my parents got divorced at thir- when I was about 13 years old, um, I still didn't want that for myself. I didn't want to be in a relationship and then have to go through that. I saw how painful it was for my parents. So beliefs that I had at that time in my life were, yeah, marriage is forever. And I didn't have necessarily um, the roles, like established roles, like the women should stay home and cook and clean and the, the dad should do all, go to work, right? Because my parents lived a different type of life. My mom worked. She was not a stay-at-home mom. She was not there as much. My dad worked too. And he was more of the um, parental figure in my life. So, um, you know, a lot of times people say like, oh gosh, you know, um, do you have an issue, a daddy issue or mommy issue? Or like for me, it was my mom because my mom wasn't there a lot. And so, Um, I didn't have these sort of beliefs about gender roles or anything like that, um, which is interesting because I ended up in one anyway. So from the very beginning of my life, I was always a very ambitious and driven person. Um, I always had very, very good grades, very good grades in college. And I did not have any desire to, like, I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to have children someday. That was definitely part of it. But I never felt like I wanted to then go to school and then not use my education and then stay home. Right. And that's fine for people who did that. And I did it for a very, very long time myself, but that was never what I wanted to do. Right. I felt like I want to use my education. I want to go be successful at work. I want to make money. I want to contribute to the family. I want to, um, you know, if I do have children, show my children that this is an option for them as well. But that's not how my life turned out. Now, it did turn out that way for a short period of time. Um, I did end up going into the corporate world after I got my degree. And then I worked in the corporate world for about five years very successfully. So eventually you met your abuser, the abuser, this the person that this story is about in college. So uh, tell us how you met. At a very young age of 19, um, after I had graduated high school and I was in my first year of college, um, I was really desperate to be in a relationship. Like all my friends had boyfriends and I just wanted to be in a relationship. I wanted someone to see me again. That's that there's this pattern here. And someone, um, was, I was set up on a blind date, average looking guy, you know, really nice, really funny, smart, had his life together went to church every weekend, seems like picture perfect from the outside. And he took an interest in me. And at first I wasn't even like super interested in him, but once he started showing me a lot of interest, it was like, okay, well, this is probably something I want to pursue. So very, very quickly, this turned into a love bombing situation. Um, And of course, back then I had no idea what love bombing was. And I grew up in a society like many people who believe that you're going to ride off into the sunset with the man of your dreams and your knight in shining armor is going to come and take you away and all of this stuff. So that's what I felt like I had encountered. And so the, the love bombing was pretty severe. It was buying me anything that I wanted because he had some money. And um, even at the young age of 19 and his parents had money, um, he was buying me tickets to concerts on his birthday and saying, no, go, 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 you go do that. You know? And I was feeling like, oh my gosh, like taking me on shopping sprees, um, telling me I was his soulmate. I was the love of his life would do anything for me. Right. And so I really truly believe at this point that this person was going to be my forever person. I was in totally in love with this person at that time. And, um, I remember specifically, there was a time we were only about three months in, 
and there were some he was in a fraternity and i was not in a sorority but he had a lot of friends and he lived on campus and um there were girls and there were guys and something was starting to like send up red flags to me and i was like there's these other girls that keep visiting and calling and i was like thinking well wait a minute we're in this like really deep like love tornado right now and um what is going on with all these other girls so i basically went to him in a very mature way and said hey i'm not real comfortable with this so if you want to have a relationship with me you're going to have to stop talking to all these other girls and he sort of looked at me like almost shocked but sort of happy i guess and was like okay yeah like that's fine i'll i'll totally do that and i was like sweet so from then on he was he was not entertaining any other girls that I was aware of. Um, and I truly believe at that point, he was totally focused on me at that point. So that was about three months into the relationship. And I want to say it was probably, it probably continued like this for another six months or so. And then at that point, things started to change and become more controlling and more, Criti- it was very critical of me, um, started to devalue me, started to make me feel bad about myself, guilting, things like that, like those kind of typical ways that sort of sneak in. Now, he was very, very, very sneaky about it. So it didn't raise a ton of alarms. It, there was no like shoving me up against a wall or like grabbing me or like there was none of that. It was all very mental. It was all very like a psychological trip that I was on. And so I didn't know. And at that time, I couldn't pinpoint what it was, but I started to feel icky about things. I started to feel like I don't like this or we'd get into fights and we start arguing about stuff. And um, the fights were very calm, for lack of a better word. They might drag on for four hours, but they were calm. And um, he was the kind of person that would just, his volume would lower the longer the conversation went on. And if I would get more amped up, his volume would get lower. So I sort of overlooked a lot of the things that were happening during the dating period. So you were dealing with a water torturer from the Lundy Bancroft list. You just didn't know it yet because, um, you know, why would you think this at the age of, of 19? And for those of you that don't uh, know what a water torturer is, there's someone who is... Uh, can really give really digging remarks and all these things and really stay flat uh, when they're talking. They're, they're not giving any sort of rage at all, so it seems like everything's even keeled. And when you react to that, they can then point to you and say, you're the one that is raging to make it seem like you're the crazy person and that it's probably your fault and to really start internalizing all of that stuff. So was that what was going on with you at that time? Yeah, and and it progressively got worse, and can, that theme continued throughout my my relationship with this person. Because, like I said before, I was with them for twenty years before I realized that it was abuse and was able to get out. But um, during that time, you know, I didn't I didn't know. And you only know what you know. And at that time, I'm just sitting there thinking, okay, well, maybe I did do something wrong, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, or you know you know, if I'm going to be a mature partner, I need to think about this differently. Or, you know, I was doing all the things that I thought was the right way to do it. But it was just, again, the the fingers were pointed back to me um, almost every single time and every single argument. This was the first really serious relationship I had been in. And the one that I felt the most uh, attached to, right? I felt really, really attached to this person. I felt I was able to be very vulnerable. I was able to share all of my deepest secrets and not feel judged about them like at the very beginning. But then what I didn't know later was that that stuff would come back to bite me and it would be used against me. And, you know, your family's crazy and you're crazy. And, you know, the, this is why you're the way you are because of the experiences you had and things like that. So yeah, definitely was a theme. And when it comes to um, these things that are happening early on, you have real, really no blueprint to what a relationship is supposed to look like. And did you have any beliefs like relationships are hard or relationships take work or anything like that that kind of got involved there? 
Yeah, I think, I think definitely for sure. Um, you know, and I'm big on, you know, understanding what's going on in your mind now. Back then I didn't have a clue about this stuff, but looking back, I can see that I believed things like relationships take hard work and, um, you know, if you want a marriage to last, you have to work on yourself. And, and I'm not saying those things aren't necessarily true, but when you're operating on these type of core beliefs, then, you know, it will, your behavior is going to follow. So my behavior was, I just got to do more. Right. And then I also had these deep beliefs from a child, my childhood, that if I just did more, or if I was just better, or if I just, um, made him happy or did something different, then everything would be okay. I would be loved. He would be happy with me. And then our marriage would be, or relationship would be a okay. So yeah, I definitely believe that. So when it comes to him as a person, who is he? Like, why do you like, yes, there was the love bombing. Mm -hmm. Why do you like him? And when you earlier told the story about you saying, hey, I want all those other people gone. Mm -hmm. Did you, was this like a big man on campus kind of person? And did you think like, I won this person just like it was the the bachelor or the bachelorette. And like that in itself is this thing of like, I am chosen. Yeah, I, I totally think that's true because when I, or I, I wrote, so I have a book that I wrote this whole entire story. So you can read all the details in this book. Um, but the, what I did was I wrote in there the, the day that I met him. And when I walked into that um, dorm there was tons of people there. They were, they were having drinks, they were partying, and we were supposed to be going on a date. We were supposed to be going on our very first date, a blind date. And there was a girl draped across his lap and he looked cool and he had friends. And I was like, okay. And, and that's why I said, like, I wasn't initially, like I was sort of put off by that. Like I was sort of like, what is he doing? Like, you're supposed to be going on a date with me and you have some girl sitting on your lap. And so I was sort of thought that was a bit rude, but then when we went out, he revealed his charm and how funny he was and all of the things that I knew about him, like how intelligent he was and the, the family that the family unit that he was from, that was very solid. And he was, he was just to me, like, it was like a perfect package. And so I thought, I think now thinking back about it, it was more like, yeah, he will, he will choose me. Like I will get him to choose me. And uh, now I'm like, oh my gosh, what was, what was I thinking? You know, but, but now when I see it for really what it is, it was all these other people are around, everybody liked him, but that person is going to choose me. And he did. He totally did. So I guess the stuff is happening at the six month mark. Mm -hmm. um, and you're figuring things out, uh, what happens from here? Well, I, I overlooked pretty much everything. Um, during this time, um, we're just continuing the relationship. We're getting to know each other. And, um, I'm still overlooking these like l slight little things that would happen. Um, things that I didn't necessarily like where he might say something a little bit off putting to me or about my family or about my friends or things like that. And, you know, I just thought, well, he's a really smart guy and he knows a lot and, you know, he's looking out for me. And he would say that a lot, like, you know, you don't, you don't know a whole lot of stuff about the world and, you know, I'm trying to look out for you and, you know, this is for your benefit. And, you know, I want you to be, have good people around you and, you know, this isn't a good friend or that's not a good person or whatever that might be. So I started to trust him a lot during this time period. And then one day, um, I was probably, gosh, we hadn't even been dating for that long. He, he ended up proposing to me. Narcissist Apocalypse is sponsored by BetterHelp. My biggest issue in life is finding balance. So when I'm being my best self, I feel grounded, at peace, and safe. But if you know me, I get overwhelmed very easily. And most of the time, I find it very troubling to find balance on my own, which is why I love working with my therapist to help me find that balance. 
And through my therapist, I've learned techniques to help me stay in the moment and also to say the word no, which is a big thing for me. So working with my BetterHelp therapist helps me become the best version of me, and I think they can help you too. So if you're thinking of trying therapy, BetterHelp is a great option. I use it, and it's convenient and flexible, affordable, and everything is entirely online. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. It got me there. So visit BetterHelp.com slash nap today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash nap. So a lot of the stuff that is you just mentioned is he's really trying to make himself the authority in your world. Yes. And that you are dependent on him as far as being the truth teller of of everything and it's the beginning of isolation in a lot of ways where instead of going to other people and trusting other people, everything will revolve around him. And uh, like all, like his, his word is the gospel at this point. 100%, 100% agree with that. And of course I couldn't piece that together or didn't understand it. I just started to think, well, maybe my judgment of these people is off because I've known these people my whole life. And, you know, maybe he sees something that I don't see. So it did become him being the authority where I would just rely on him for the information. Even if I didn't even ask him, he would still be giving it to me and still telling me it. But that was just perpetuating that um, position for him in that relationship. Yeah, because he's also a bit of a Mr. Right on the abuser list. He's a combination of the uh, water torture and the Mr. Right. So eventually... um, you get to, you get proposed to. So tell us, uh, walk us through the beginning of all that. So the day we got um, engaged, he had um, called me at work and he said, Hey, and I worked late. I worked uh, late nights and he said, come over. Um, I I really want to see you. And he still lived with his parents at this point. So I was like, all right, I really, I want to go home and change first. He said, no, 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 hurry. Just come over. Just come over. I'm like, okay, fine. So I went over there and he had a scavenger hunt ready for me. And it was like these little post-it notes throughout the house. It was really sweet. And um, I followed the post-it notes <laughs> and the last one ended up in his parents' bedroom. And it was like on the mirror. And I didn't, I was like, what? I just thought we were just doing a little scavenger hunt, you know? And so I looked and there was a rose lying there and my ring was inside of the rose. And before I knew it, I turned around and I knew he was, he was on his knees to propose to me and his mom jumps out of the closet with a camera to take pictures of this very intimate moment. And I will talk a little bit about her because she, I believe is a big mastermind um, behind a lot of the um, cult like activity in the narcissistic family that I was part of. But of course I said, yes, you know, at at that point, I I wasn't going to say no, but I remember thinking like how absolutely awkward that my mother-in-law to be is standing here in this moment and I'm in her room. It was just so weird. It was just so unbelievably awkward and weird, but I, I was still craving, right. That relationship and wanting to be married. And, you know, so I said, yes. And we ended up getting married. Like, by the time I was 21. So from 19 to 21 was the time that we were together and all of this stuff was sort of unfolding. And then we ended up married when I was 21. So I was really young, really, really young. I didn't have any other married friends or anything like that. So, um, it was very quick. And I do remember, like, I don't think my family wasn't telling me no, or you should wait, or you should, you know, just date a little bit longer. Like no one ever even said, anything like that. It was sort of exciting for everybody. So I didn't really think anything of it. I didn't think, oh no, I shouldn't be married at 21. I mean, he had a, he had a really great job. We bought our first house like immediately, like we, we were financially fine. Um, so it just sort of made sense. It was like, yeah, like why not? Let's get married. So we did. So this is the part that I think is, um, important to note. So again, I said, I, 
I was in college. I had a, I got into the corporate world. I was a very successful human resources um, employee at a fortune 500 company for five years. He also had a very good job during this time. We didn't have any kids or anything, but we had a house. The first year I was married, I thought was the worst year of my entire life. It was absolutely horrific. And I just remember thinking, I wonder if everybody has their first year of marriage feel like this. I wonder if the first year of marriage is just this horrible for everyone. And so, you know, I would talk to people and, oh yeah, marriage is hard and, you know, just got to work on it and this and that and the other. And so I, I did, and we kept, you know, kept going and kept going. And, um, it, the real part of the abuse was, I mean, it was throughout, right. It was sprinkled throughout all of it, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, sexual co coercion, financial abuse, neglect, like all of that stuff was happening during that time. But the real piece of when this, this like light switch flipped was when I had my first child and became a stay home mom. That was when everything just was downhill from there. The thing that was really interesting about this was that my, my now ex, his mom was a stay home mom of his, he and his brothers. His brother's wives all were stay-at-home moms. And this expectation was that you would be a stay-at-home mom. Like, this was sort of like this expectation. His aunts, his grandmas, like all of these, everybody was a stay-at-home mom. So I really did want to be able to spend time with my kids. Like, I didn't have any children before, and I was, like, really excited about it. But there was a, a, an element of um, pressure that if you were not a stay home mom, that you were a bad person or you didn't care about your kids, or if you don't take this opportunity, because, you know, there are people out there who have to work. They don't have the financial means to be a stay home mom, but you do, right? Allison, you can stay home. So you should. And so that pressure from him and from his family, it was like, I sort of started to believe that they were right. And I started, started to believe that, yeah, maybe I, sh maybe I am a bad person if I don't take this opportunity, you know, cause why would you want someone else raising your children if you didn't have to and things like that? So I really joyfully jumped at that opportunity. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. Because I am so grateful now that I have the memories that I have with my children that I could raise them and, and give them the best mothering that I could. But that was the point in my life where all of my power just disappeared because I had no financial um, independence at that point. I lost um, relationships with people who I used to work with that were part of like outside of this cult. Um, so it really was the, the tipping point for me to where the abuse really kind of sunk, sunk its claws into me. So... I guess, start taking us through the different types of things that were happening. All right. So, wow. Okay. So I would say, um, let's first talk about, you know, the financial piece of this, because like I said, that was a, a really big point here. I wasn't making any money anymore, right? I was a stay-at-home mom. Now, somebody like him would say things like, your job is so valuable. Being a stay home mom is like a, a gift. And, you know, you're allowing me to go work so that I, you know, can provide for you so that you can, you know, raise our children. Right. So he was all saying all the right things. But when I would go places to buy things, I'd have to bring, bring in receipts home every time, even to the grocery store. Like, let me see the receipts, whatever you're buying. I need to see, you need to make sure that it's like within the um, parameters of what he felt like was a value and that what I should be spending the money on. Everything was scrutinized. I wasn't allowed allowed to buy um, myself just anything. It had to be on sale or it had to be with a coupon or it had to be from Goodwill. And mind you, my ex-husband made about, mm, well, he was making multi-six figures. Let's just put it that way. And um, I think he was like, a hoarder for money. Like he wanted to look at his um, bank account every single day. He wanted to know, he wanted me to see what our net worth is every day. He'd come over and say, come look, come look, let's see what our net worth is. So it was very, very money driven. Um, he was a, a intelligent guy when it came to math and numbers and things like that. And so um, that just really 
solidified the financial abuse because it would be like, well, you don't know what you're doing with money and you don't know how to manage money. And when you met me, you only had a thousand dollars in your bank account. And there was a lot of like devaluing me. I mean, I graduated magna cum laude from college. I had great grades. I had, I believed that I was good with money. I had savings and things like that. But when you're dealing with somebody like this, they turn it around on you and make you believe that you're no good with it. So then again, it's what you were saying. He ended up being this authority on our entire financial situation. And so when that happens, at least for me, I didn't feel like I had any power to choose anything. I felt completely dependent on him and I felt completely um, like I had no opinion. My opinions didn't matter when it came to anything, because no matter what I said, it would always be shot down. Like you don't understand finances and you don't know how to manage money and things like that. So it's almost like, how can he trust me? And that's the sort of way that I started to feel was like, I'm an untrustworthy, worthy person. So now I have to follow all of these rules. So the financial abuse was really big. It kept me in line. Let's just say that it kept me in line. The fear of what was going to happen kept me in line and behaving how he wanted me to behave when it came to the money. So after, you know, it's hard because I didn't even know that there was financial abuse was a thing, right? I didn't even have a clue. I just thought, oh, he's a little controlling. And I would remember calling his mom up and saying, he won't even let me buy this. And da, 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 da. And she, she would actually double down because I think she wanted to maintain this facade, this outer appearance of her family, how she raised her children, um, the the daughter in laws that were now in the in the picture, the children who were the grandchildren. I think she wanted to maintain this like bub- this bubble um, that would be impenetrable to anyone. So, if I would ever go to her and com- I had a good relationship with her, I would go to her and cry on her shoulder and complain about how her son was treating me and complain about the things that he was doing and she would even sometimes go to him and say hey you need to do this or you know why are you doing that and they'd get into it and stuff like that so she actually took my side a lot of times but i don't think that th- it was ever intended to change him or get him to change his ways i think it was just to keep that facade intact for her because she i think looked at herself sort of as the matriarch and so everybody else looking in from the outside would say, well, what has she created in this family? And I think that's how she viewed it. So if her sons were not successful, if they weren't treating their wives right, if she would absorb that for herself, like that must be on her. So I think she wanted to protect it and make sure that it stayed functional and then from the outside or from the outside looking in, that it looked perfect, perfectly smooth. So I sort of upset that apple cart when I ended up, you know, exposing this and this abuse and leaving. But so when it comes to your family and your friends, you're confiding in his family. Are you able to confide confide in yours, or are you keeping all of your stuff like to you know? You're you're part of in a in a in a weird way. If you're not and you're just confiding in the other family, you're you're protecting that family. And did you know that if you were doing that? Yeah. So basically because the isolation happened pretty early on in the relationship where, as I mentioned before, well, I don't like this friend or I don't want you hanging out with her and she's a bad influence on you. Um, it wasn't even just my friends that were that, that way. Like I had certain friends that he would not allow to have me have them in our wedding. Um, and it was also my family. So my mother. And he got into a fight um, when I was before we got married when I was 19. And um, from then on, he always uh, tried to keep me from my mom. So a lot of the things that he was doing was basically brainwashing me about who my mom was. Like I knew my mom for my whole life. My mom and I had a good relationship my whole life. But now it was your mom's a bad person. Your mom doesn't have your best interest. Your mom only cares about herself, you know, and like all these things. And he kept, anytime my mom and I would even get into the slightest disagreement about anything, he would jump in, he would capitalize on that and say, see, see, look how she's acting. She doesn't care about you. Like, this isn't who you want in your life. I don't want her around you. I don't want her around me. I don't want her around our kids. So 
my mom was not like she was really the one that he sort of attacked to kind of isolate from me and i think it was because he knew that she knew what he was my mom was the, like the one who could see him for what he truly was and i think he knew that and that's why he wanted her out of the picture so i would always come up with excuses every time my mom would call i'd be like oh sorry we can't we're busy or you know, i'd have these hip pocket responses because if I ever said, oh, my mom's just going to stop by, it, we would get into a huge fight over that. Like he would absolutely blow up, like not in the way that like you would think like somebody who's really malignant would, but like, why would you do that? And you know how, she, you know, how she is and how I feel about that. And, you know, we'd get into these long drawn out conversations that were really, really, really hard because I felt pulled in two different directions between my mom and between him. So the isolation was what was happening there. So I didn't really have anyone else to turn to. So that's why I was going to his mom. You know, I was going to her because this whole family was like this little cult. And like, we all relied on each other. We all, and, and there was a lot of dysfunction there too. We'd talk about each other badly. We would, you know, dig up other people's problems and create there was drama created within but it was all inside this bubble right so nobody else would know so i didn't really have the option to reach out to other people and i did try a little bit i think what you were saying too is protecting um my my ex-husband protecting him at the time um because i was afraid like if i did tell like reach out and tell someone that maybe they would tell me something like that's not okay. And he, you know, even though I kind of wanted to hear that anyway, I think I was afraid. I think I was afraid to hear that. I just wanted her to fix it. I, when I would go to my mother-in-law, I just wanted her to fix it. Like, go tell your son to stop acting like this. Tell him to stop being so hypocritical. Tell him to stop being so controlling. And she would, but of course it would never change. You went to the cult leader to ask the, <laughs> cult, to ask the cult leader for help. That's the problem. Yeah. And so... She was, I feel like the the ringleader, the mastermind behind all of it because she wanted to keep everything intact. And, you know, I had sort of the picture perfect life. I had, you know, a, a husband who had a really good job. Um, I had three really great kids. We lived in a nice neighborhood. We had um, pretty much everything you could possibly imagine. Um, but on the inside, I was dying. Like I was literally feeling like I was withering away to nothing. I felt like I, I literally felt like there's something wrong with me. And every single day of my life, I prayed that he would die. I literally wanted him gone. And now looking back, I know that it wasn't that it wasn't really that it was that I wanted to just stop hurting. I wanted the quickest and easiest way for me to feel better would be if he would just vanish out of my life. You know, there were times that I felt like I could just get in the car with my kids and drive to Mexico and never come back. And I had this obsession with him disappearing from my life. And I didn't care how, like, I didn't care if he fell off a ladder. I didn't care if he crashed his car. I didn't care. I didn't care. I just got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't know what else to do. And I just had these like visions in my head repeating over and over that I just wanted this person gone. And I felt like my life would be easier and better if that was true. Um, but he's still alive and well today. <laughs> I will, I will, will give that spoiler. Um, but um, I think it's important to note for survivors, especially that there's nothing wrong with you if you have these sort of feelings or thoughts, because when you are in such a fight or flight position and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to behave and you don't know what's right, what's wrong. Can you trust yourself? Can you not like these kinds of things will happen and it is not uncommon for people to feel like this. So during this horrible time of my life, when I just felt like everything was my fault, I couldn't do anything right. Um, all I was doing was trying to do more. I was like reaching this unreachable goal. Like, uh, okay, I'll just do more today. Okay, I'll just, you know, iron his shirts better. And I'll just, you know, pack his lunch and 
put stamp little hearts on his sandwiches or whatever it was. Like I just did anything I could do to make him happy, but it was never, ever enough. And so I felt like I'm just literally like killing myself, like doing all of this stuff and it's not getting anywhere. It's not earning me anything. I, I wasn't feeling better about myself. He wasn't treating me any differently, but yet I kept doing it. I kept doing more and more and more and more and more. And I was exhausted. I was completely exhausted and I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do. So I sort of retreated because, you know, there was, like I said, there was a lot of control. There was a lot of criticism. I couldn't do anything right. He was the one saying to me, you need to go to therapy. You're crazy. You need to talk to the doctor. You need to get help. There's something wrong with you, right? I have like emails of this from him still where it was all about me. And I remember saying to him one time, do you think you would go to therapy with me? And, and remember all of this is happening over the span of 20, 17 years of our marriage. And he said, no, I'm not going to go to therapy. There's nothing wrong with me. You go to therapy. And I said, well, I will, but couldn't you even just go to support me and like be there for me and help? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You fix you. You figure this out yourself. You know, I'm not, I can't figure out you. You figure out you. So um, I did. I did. I went to the doctors. I got medicated. I was on Zoloft. I was like trying so hard, just like thinking, oh my God, there's something wrong with me. Like, what is so wrong with me that I can't, our marriage is going to fall because of me. Our marriage is going to end because of me. And um, I ended up retreating sort of into social media because I didn't have access to a lot of people in the outside world. And so I was on my phone, on Twitter a lot, and I was making friends with people and I was interacting and I was you know, getting a lot of likes and a lot of confirmation on the things that I was saying from people. And I remember one day I was talking to somebody in, in a, like the DM messages and I was saying, oh, my husband's driving me crazy and this is what he did and da, da, da. And the person replied to me and said, your husband sounds like a sociopath. And I was like, what? That's like psychopath, narcissist behavior. And I was like, no, my husband's not like, because in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking about like the Hollywood version of that. And I really was like, no, this is, this is not, this is not happening. So I got off of there and didn't really give it a second thought. And, um, a little while later, I you know, it's still that seed planted in my head. And so I'm like, well, maybe I should just like read about this and like look it up. Because when I hear of narcissism back then, I just thought it was like somebody who was just super vain and felt like that they had to love themselves and look at themselves in the mirror all the time. But really it was something way more evil and sinister. And so I looked it up and then I, all of a sudden I was checking all the boxes like, oh my gosh, that's, that's how he is. That's how he is. That's how he is. I was checking every single box. And so I went back online and I, I messaged that person and I said, holy moly, you are hundred percent right. This is exactly what I'm dealing with. And right then and there, my head just sort of exploded and all the emotions. I was scared. I was um, I was like angry. I was like, I, how can somebody do this? How could somebody do this to me on purpose? So I was really, really, I was very scared because I was like, now I know what I'm dealing with and I've been dealing with for the past 17 years. Now, how do I get out of this? And so that was really a, a magical part of my life. Like I, I owe that person so much for bringing that to my awareness, right? Like I was the one that looked it up. I was the one that figured it out, put the pieces together, but I would have never known. I could have continued another 10 or 20 years or till the day I died if I had never known that. So that was really the point for me where I was able to get to planning and escape and getting out. So I guess take us through, you know, planning and escaping and, and getting out. All right. I will be happy to do that. So the first thing that I will say is that if you are someone who has planned an escape, you got to give yourself a lot of credit, right? Even if you planned it and you come back seven times or eight times or however many times, right? For me, it was like, I had to leave. I could not stay a minute longer with this person. So I ended up planning over the course of about three months 
all very secretively. I turn off my Wi-Fi anytime I was on my computer or any, or not my computer, on my phone. Um, I never searched on anything on the Wi-Fi at home computer. Um, I was keeping secret um, stashes of money um, anytime I, like I would squirrel away money. So if like somebody gave me cash, like to reimburse me for something, I would just put it in, in a secret hiding place um, because I didn't know what I was going to need. And I didn't know if I was going to have any access to anything. And I was afraid if he found out, he might cut everything off. So he sort of had an idea. He sort of had a clue because I said, I basically put my foot down and said, we need to go to therapy. And the reason I did that was because I want, I didn't feel comfortable telling him I wanted to separate. Um, I felt very scared of what would happen if I told him face to face. So I basically forced him to go to a therapy session with me. And I told him that in that therapy session that I, I did not want to be married anymore to him. And, um, so he, at that point, what happened was he did a complete 180. So I'm still planning to leave. And my, my goal is to leave. He doesn't know this. He thinks that he's going to be able to turn this around. And the 180 happens where he's, basically waiting on me hand and foot, doing all these things for me, looking like a wounded puppy, crying, crocodile tears, like all the whole show, right? But at this point, I was like, it's too late. I don't believe you. It's been 17 years, 20 years together, 17 of our marriage. I don't believe that you're ever going to change. I truly did not believe it. And um, I kept going. I kept the momentum. I kept planning. And um, one day I... Well, I'd already gotten my attorney. I got that all figured out and he didn't know anything. He didn't know anything. And one day I picked up my kids from school and in the parking lot, I sent him an email that basically said, I'm divorcing you. Where do you want the paper sent? And I went straight to my mom's house because I was too scared too, right? I didn't want, and I'd done the research and I knew that, you know, the first, however many 24 hours after something like this happens or the, the the least safe time for someone who is escaping. So I wanted to make sure that my kids and I were in a safe place and that he could process it with his attorney, his family, or however that was going to go down. So I did, I made it out. Like I escaped, I planned my escape. I got out, I lined up a place to live. Um, I got a really great attorney. And I know a lot of people don't, not everyone has that opportunity. Um, But one thing I will say that was really, really helpful to me. And I love to remind people about this. If you can ask your attorney about status quo, status quo is where you get to stay on the same financial um, situation as long until you're divorced, right? So if you decide to separate, then the money is still the same. You could use the same credit cards, same bank accounts, and nothing changes. So some people don't realize that that's an option. So um, if you do have an attorney, just always ask about that because that could be something that could really, really help you financially for the time that you're getting out and leaving the abuse. So there's a lot of fear going on at this point for you. The perfectionist in you and the relationship ending, you know, you, this was 20 years. So 17 of it in marriage, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. How's that person feeling? You have the fear part of you, but how about the part where, well, things didn't go as planned. And, you know, I think a lot of people, when they're going through abuse, they're going through abuse cycles. It sounds like you didn't have really cycles because you were already, he was such an authority that there was really no buttering up, I think, throughout it based upon what I can hear. Well, there was a little bit of that like cycle of idealize and devalue and discard um, because like I didn't realize I was trauma bonded while I was in the marriage, right? Because I wanted to leave so many times. I wanted to try to, you know, like I was just really felt frustrated. Like I couldn't do anything right. Nothing was changing. Everything was the same. But there were times that he would say things to me. He would do nice things for me. He would say things to me like, you're really smart. Like, you're, I know you can figure this out. Like say things like, you know, um, you're so beautiful. And, um, if you would only just work on this one little thing, everything would be perfect. And so he, he did like definitely drip those, those love 
I mean, it wasn't heavy. I will, tell you, I will tell you that it wasn't heavy at all, but it was enough to keep me hanging on. It was enough to keep me wanting more. So yes. And like devalue me, criticize me. And then I'd get silent treatments, you know, then, or then I would get like, you know, not want to talk to me for a week, not, not want me to even be, be around me. So, but then it would come back and then we would reconnect and then it would be that same thing over and over. So yeah, I mean, maybe I missed part of that explaining that, but yeah, I think that I was trauma bonded in the relationship. I didn't realize that, but once I realized that what was happening, I was no longer trauma bonded. I was like, I'm out of here. I cannot deal with this. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm so disgusted that you did this to me on purpose. Like you tricked me, like you totally tricked me and pulled the wool over my eyes and made me think this was me when it was you the whole time. Like I can do so much better. I don't, I don't need to be with a person who is going to treat me like that. So yeah, I do think there was a, a little bit of that cycle happening for sure. And uh, going back to uh, the fear-based part, um, you have this other part of you here where you being a perfectionist that there might be the failure aspect and how you're dealing with that at that time. Is that something you're thinking about at that time? And I guess obviously you're, you're, you're getting away and you're feeling good about getting away, but how are you feeling about yourself during this time? Because how, you know, you've been feeling, but have you been scared to get to this point of, Mm -hmm. of going through that? Okay. So I will say in this, I think I'm going to identify this time frame from the time that I left to like the first year after was, I want to call it the swamp. Like that's the swamp. It was horrible. It was court. It was him trying to reach out to me through the kids and send notes through their backpacks and get all the flying monkeys involved and having all my friends and reaching out to people who Um, I hadn't talked to in years and him trying to build his case and it was horrible. I didn't feel like a loss per se of the marriage, right? I didn't feel like, um, this is, this is so sad. You know, yes, I did feel sad about it because I didn't never intended for my life to, to turn out like that. I had a very different vision from what I ended up with. However, I felt like there was a really, really, really dark period during that first year after I had left that I call the swamp where I almost thought I could go back. Maybe if I just go back, things will be easier. Maybe if I just have a conversation with him, we can work it out. Maybe I, maybe I over, overestimated this, or maybe I, you know, was being a little too sensitive or maybe I made it out worse than what it really was, right? I think these are things a lot of survivors wrestle with in their mind. And this was something that I was really deeply struggling with for a significant period of time because it was so hard. But I think that when I logically looked at it, I had a really, really heart to heart with myself in the mirror. And I basically said, don't you ever, ever, ever give up. Because I realized at that moment that that was me about to concede. That was me about to give up, right? Because it was so hard and it was so difficult. And there were so many things I had to deal with that I didn't want to deal with. And my kids were like, mom, you're the one that did this to us. And mom, you're the one that caused this problem, right? So I'm taking the bullets. I'm having to deal with court. He's doing things. People around me. It's just like everybody from every angle. And I felt like this is too much. I can't handle this. But once I had that heart to heart with myself, I realized this was just me trying to make my life easier. This was me just trying to, you know, give up. And I, I told myself, I never give up. Don't you ever, ever, ever give up. So it was in that moment that I realized like, this is, I'm in this for the long haul. I, I decided to, to divorce and escape this person. So whatever comes my way, I'm going to deal with this is just part of the package. It doesn't mean that my life is over. It doesn't mean I'm always going to have to deal with difficult things. It doesn't mean everything's going to be awful forever or in the swamp forever. So my perception of that may be a little bit different um, from some people. 
so after you left, you know, you went to your mom's, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, how was the divorce process after in custody and what type of battles did you have to go through with him? And then maybe the influence of his family that surrounds him, because I assume the army will start backing him at that point, And maybe the mom might come up to lead this charge. I might, I have no idea. I'm flying blind here. You just have that kind of general knowledge about how these kinds of people operate and you're spot on because there were so many things that I just couldn't believe like that these people were capable of after I left. But remember, I burst that bubble. I was the one in the family that divorced out of the family. And I think that was really, really um, earth shattering for them. And now all of a sudden, everybody's going to go, oh, what happened? And why are they divorced? And this perfect little family is disrupted. I wonder why. And, and I think that, um, yes, you're absolutely right. But the one thing I, I remember was um, like the fact that they would just lie right on the stand, like just flat out lie. And I I sat there and I was just dumbfounded because I'm here telling the truth. I'm just saying the truth, telling the things, trying to be, be completely transparent. And then I hear their parent, his parents saying things like, no, we never, we never intended that money to be for her, the money that we gifted to them. Um, and I, I couldn't even believe my ears because they had written us a check while we were married. And now he was trying to get that money back from me out of our, you know, out of our joint assets. And I couldn't believe that they would just flat out lie in court like that. I just, it was just beyond me. It was just beyond me. And so there was a lot of the, I talk a little bit about the flying monkeys and how my ex-husband's um, friends and um, family members were reaching out to me and saying, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you're going to go through with this? And how, what about the kids and like guilting? And, but of course I never, I did not. And to this day, I do not say he is a narcissist. I do not say that. Right. Cause there's no reason to, there's no reason to say that I can describe his behavior. I can say how controlling he was. I can say that he was critical of me. I can say how he coerced me sexually, physically, um, emotionally abused me, neglect me financially. I can say all that. I can describe that behavior, but it would do me no good to just say, I'm not going to be with him because he's a narcissist and quit trying to, to reel me back into the family. Like I kept that very, very quiet. And the other reason I kept it quiet was because I didn't want him to think that I knew that about him so that now all of a sudden his tactics can change on me, right? Right now, his tactics are very predictable. I know what he's going to do. I can pretty much predict every single step that he takes um, when it comes to court and things like that. And so we're still in court. It's been five years. I was just meeting with my lawyer today because I have to go to court next week. So he's still trying to exert control. He's still trying to um, make me do things his way and how he thinks that I should behave and what he thinks I should do to parent our children. So though it's gotten a little bit less over time, it's still happening. So my old, my youngest child will be 18 in like five years. So I still have five years that I could potentially be dealing with the court systems and him, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's actually it's actually not um, terrible for me because I'm really confident. I have a really great attorney and I'm really confident in how I operate and how I communicate with him and how our interactions are together. And, um, we don't ever speak in person. Like that's my choice. I have told uh, my children this, like, I don't want to speak to someone who hurts me and abuses me. And I don't want to pretend to be friends with someone like that. So all of our communication is done on an app on the, our family wizard app, because there's no reason for me. I don't, I don't interact with his family and I have to see him. I have to see him in our community. I have to see him at my kids' events and their sports activities and school and things like that. But I have really, really strong boundaries. So the divorce situation was horrific at the beginning. It's gotten easier as time has gone by, especially as you get more confident and you start building more skills and things like that. But I'm still in it. I'm still dealing with it. And it's been five years. And how are your kids doing as far as understanding who everyone is and 
uh, influence from the other people probably barking in their ears about who you are. Yes. Um, and we have 50, 50 custody because, you know, as you know, emotional abuse is really hard to prove. And, um, I had never filed a restraining order. I had never had to call the cops or anything like that, because this is all mental. This is all emotional and psychological stuff. So it was really, really hard for me to prove any of that. So we have 50, 50 custody. And that was really hard for me too, because I knew that even though I was leaving, I was sending my kids back over there, right? 50% of the time, my kids are going to have to deal with this person, right? And I didn't know if he was going to abuse them like he abused me. And it turns out that he did, right? And he still does. But my kids, I have never flat out said to my kids, your dad's a bad person. Your dad's a, you know what? I don't disparage him. I don't call him things. I don't do any of that because I want my kids to see for themselves and they have. So what happens is my kids experience things and then they come back to me and they say, ah, oh, dad did this or he said that or whatever. And then I can basically empathize with them and say, yeah, I understand that because that happened to me too. I understand that those kinds of things, you know, that's not okay. And, you know, I, I'm really sorry that you have to deal with that, but you're really strong. And I know that you'll um, use your, use your logic and use your brain to kind of understand what's happening and protect yourself. And um, they are, my oldest is 16. I have a 15 year old and I have a almost 13 year old and they are very, very, very aware of what love bombing is. Like I've taught them all of these things. Like they know about gaslighting. They know about manipulation and coercion and like, they know all of these things. So they're, them being aware of this stuff is going to set them up for a really, really strong position in their life. But I think it was really important to note that I didn't have to say anything bad about him because he's doing it himself right? He's showing him or he's showing them who he really is. And I think that's way more impactful than me just going around telling them, you know, oh, your dad's this or your dad's that. So they're doing really well. So in our brief communication before we jumped on this recording, you mentioned to me that your healing process wasn't an easy process. You know, you were writing a book and that was a huge part of things but also you told me that conventional therapy worked in many ways, but in some ways it didn't work for you as well. So walk us through that. Okay, so the healing for me, um, well, one, my book was really healing to write it. It was very cathartic. And as soon as I left, I was like, I gotta tell people about this because there's probably thousands and thousands and thousands of people out there who are experiencing this and just have no idea. And um, I wanted people to feel um, validated and I wanted them to feel hopeful and inspired. So just writing, it took me two years, but just writing my book was very, very healing. Um, And I went to therapy as soon as I got out. Like I went to therapy for probably four and a half years um, from the day that I left him until now. Um, And therapy is good, right? Therapy was really helpful. Therapy connected a lot of dots for me. Um, It opened my eyes to my childhood and things like that, which was really, really helpful. But the problem I was having was every time I would leave my therapist, I'd still get triggered. I would still have, I was still having nightmares. I was still um, bursting into tears, just driving down the road. You know, I was still having these leftover effects. And I was like, what is happening? Like, how long is this going to last? I can't be, I can't be dealing with this for the rest of my life. I felt like he was still living inside me. I felt like he, his claws, his poison was still in there. I'm like, I have got to get this out because I left him. I don't want him still living in here, right? I got to get that out. And so I ended up through my book account online and my social media account, ended up connecting with a lady who had a podcast and I started listening to it and it was really different. It was really unique and it was all about the subconscious mind and, you know, being aware of what your thoughts are and what your beliefs are and how you can actually change that in order to change how you feel. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. So I listened to her entire podcast series like twice all the way through because it was so good. And um, I ended up reaching out to her and connecting with her. And we just were chatting back and forth. And one day she said, well, have you ever thought about being a coach? 
And I thought, well, I maybe sort of thought about it, but not really seriously thought about it. And she said, well, let me know if you ever decide you want to. I started implementing the strategies that she was teaching um, for myself. And I started to feel completely different. And I was like, this is, this is life-changing. This is absolutely life-changing. This is the thing that I needed for the past four years. Like I needed to know how to do this. And if I can do this, anybody can do this. Like I need to teach people how to do this. So I ended up getting trained and certified through it. So I'll explain to you how that works. So the subconscious mind is, um, if you think about your mind having two parts, the subconscious part is like the bottom half of an iceberg, the part you don't see. And the top part is the conscious part of your brain. And the subconscious runs 95% of the show where this, the conscious mind is only, that's your logic, that's about 5%. So basically what happens is from the day that you're born, you know, we talked about that, how I was, you know, my upbringing and all of that. You're programmed just like a computer right out of the box. So you're being taught things like marriage is forever and people should never get divorced. And, um, you know, you should always be a good little girl and, you know, don't, don't cause drama, don't cause conflict, whatever those things are, like anything that you've been taught and programmed with lives in the subconscious part of your mind. But what happens is that is the driving force to your emotions. So whenever reality shows up differently, from what you are believing in your subconscious mind, then we suffer, right? So if you're believing something like divorce should never happen and then you get divorced, obviously you're going to feel horrible and you're going to feel like, oh my gosh, I, I did something wrong and I'm hurting my kids and feel guilty about it and all of this stuff. So basically what you want to do in order to change how you feel is figure out what it is that's in your subconscious mind. What are the thoughts that you're thinking? Because most people don't ever think about what they're thinking. It just is automatic. It just happens on repeat like a habit and they don't ever consider any other possibilities. So for me, this was absolutely life-changing because I started to realize I had all of these like programmed things in my mind and all these beliefs and things that were just not even true. So what I do then is I help people bring those to the surface and then we have a process that we reprogram their subconscious beliefs. And then you start to be like, oh my gosh, like when I was triggered to go to the soccer game and I couldn't stop thinking about things and my ex is there and his new girlfriend and like all, and I'm feeling icky and horrible and angry and all this stuff. I can't even focus on my kids playing soccer. I can't even be present. So doing this process releases all of that. So that stuff's not even in my head anymore. Now I could just be present. So for me, it was absolutely transformational. And that's why I do what I do because it's the only thing that ever worked for me. I did, I did breath work. I did EMDR. I did regular therapy. I did yoga. I journaled. I did meditation. All those things are wonderful. And if you do them, you know, I would say, keep doing them. They're great. But if you're not getting to the source of why you feel the way you feel. And remember, other people around you and how other people show up in the world, we can't control that. You know, all we, I can't control that my ex keeps taking me to court. I can't control that he is who he is and the narcissistic um, abuser that he is. I can't make him be different, but I can control how I process it and how I feel inside. So that's how I ended up here um, from this whole thing, from all the way from the beginning till now that. Now I can help people and I can give back to other people to help them heal on their journey from narcissistic abuse too. Absolutely. So I will say, I think that the words of wisdom are going to be different for each level of where you are, where you are in the process. So if you're in the relationship still versus if you've escaped and you're a survivor, or versus if you're thriving and, you know, moving beyond. So the most general thing that can touch each one of those that I can say is to never give up on yourself, one, because if you're a victim, you can't give up, right? You, you cannot let them destroy you. You have to keep going, keep going, keep going. Same thing when you're in survival mode, you've got to keep going. And when you're thriving, just leveling up, keeping going on the healing, doing the things that are going to help you. But more important than that, I think even, okay, so that's really important. I'll put, them, I'll put them equal, is 
you're if you're not aware of what's going on inside you, right? If you're not aware, you can't fix it. So look at yourself, right? Put the focus back on you and use the external as a mirror. So what I mean by that is like, if something is triggering you and someone else, use that person as a mirror to see what you can work on for yourself. Is that person triggering in you um, anger? What is it that you need to work on inside of yourself? Is that person triggering jealousy? Is that person triggering um, you to be defensive, right? So when things are happening outside of you, it's still a reminder to go inward and look at yourself. So that's my biggest thing I would say is, you know, just making sure that you don't give up and then always bring the focus back to you. So, Allison, I really want to thank you for being here with us today, sharing your story. You did a fantastic job today in sharing your story and sharing your knowledge and sharing everything uh, about your healing process, because there's a lot of people where their healing process uh, isn't working for them and they find conventional therapy isn't doing enough and they're always trying new things. So thank you just for sharing your feelings about everything and your full experience. It's You did a really uh, great job. So I really just can't thank you enough uh, from myself and from everyone who's been listening today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And for anyone interested in reading Allison's book, you can find the link in the show notes as well as all of her uh, information, her website and her Instagram. So please, if you're interested in getting a hold of Allison after the show, uh, everything will be in the show notes. And if you want to be a guest like Allison was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At the top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you will see all of these instructions. So please do read all of the instructions and then either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do read all of the instructions and send it in the format that we ask for. Also, at our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we have our very own support group. It's our very own safe social network on there. So if you go to NarcissistApocalypse.com and you click on our support group button, it takes you to our support group page. There you will find that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights that we also have on there, forum boards for you to post on, uh, whatever's kind of going on in your situation, you can post, you can get the validation that you need from fellow survivors, you can validate other survivors with what they're posting as well, it is a great community of people, and I can't say enough about them, they're just a wonderful group of people, so if you need support, please do join our support group. And if you need even more support, please do go visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources that can help you make sense of what you're going through. They have every phone number, every website address, every email address for uh, shelters and domestic violence agencies, no matter how big or small your town is. DomesticShelters.org has everything there. It's a wonderful organization. Everything there is free. So please do check out DomesticShelters.org. And that is it for today's show. So from myself and Allison, we hope you have a good night.